Hello, good afternoon. I'm the step in because Dr. Uh, Jack uh, disappeared. No, he had to go somewhere. So I have obviously not prepared for this, but uh, I am a technologist and I have built a healthcare digital company last three years. So I understand the problems with digital health and I have read a lot about blockchain. So I'm really curious to hear what these guys are going to say. And I hope you all agree with me that your health data is the most important data. So blockchain and healthcare obviously have an important place in the future. Question is going to be when in the future, how, which blockchain. So we'll hear from these guys and we first have a demo from Kamal at Nebula and Alex from Insilico. So over to you guys for the demo. Great. Um, yeah, so thanks for having us. So I will give a little bit of background on Nebula Genomics and the partnership we're doing with Long Genesis. Um, and then Alex will get on stage and do uh, a demo of the platform. So Nebula Genomics was founded about a year ago, and it's spun out, out, of, out of George Church's lab at Harvard University. Um, he's one of the co-founders of the company. And George Church's goal for a couple of decades was, let's make genome sequencing accessible. Um, so a lot of his work in next-gen sequencing is a big part of the reason why prices have gone down from $3 billion for one whole genome sequence to $1,000 today, just in the past 20 years or so. Um, and as, as you can see from the chart, you know, there's been a, a rapid decrease in the price of genome sequencing, but there hasn't been an equivalent rapid increase in the adoption of genomic services. Um, and for the better part of the past decade, people have been saying, once we reach the $1,000 genome, it's going to revolutionize medicine, um, it's going to revolutionize drug design. But that hasn't really been the reality that we've seen today. So we set out to figure out why is sequencing not mainstream? Why aren't a lot of people doing it? What are the biggest barriers to its adoption, not just by researchers, but also by consumers and individuals? Um, so we identified three core reasons for why it's hard to access large-scale genomic data. Um, researchers aren't really relying, it, relying on it today, mainly because of data fragmentation, uh, data ownership issues, which come into play and cause some of the data fragmentation issues, and also data generation. So to start off, uh, a lot of the health data sets that exist today exist in silos, different healthcare providers, different biobanks. Um, there's very limited incentives to actually share this data with each other. And in order to do interesting things with big genomic data, you need to aggregate a lot of data sets together, not just genome data, but also clinical records, electronic health records to complement it. Uh, this hasn't been very feasible right now. Uh, a lot of people have tried to centralize the data sets. Let's put them on one big database, put them under standard formats, make it easier to compute on, do machine learning on, AI on. Uh, but it hasn't been very successful. Even governments have tried to do this. And a lot of it comes from the, the nature of the data. A lot of it is very sensitive. Um, a lot of these healthcare providers and biobanks are also sitting on data sets that to them they feel like is a gold mine. They don't know exactly what they're going to do with it, but they don't want to give it to anyone else to monetize or to share it with others. And then another big issue is just data generation. It's really hard to get data today. Not that many people have done whole genome sequencing. Um, you probably don't know anyone who's done whole genome sequencing. You might know some people who've done genotyping, but again, that data is not super useful to researchers. So we, we talked to some, some consumers as well. Um, we wanted to figure out you know, something we say a lot is you'll pay $1,000 to get an iPhone, but you won't pay $1,000 to understand your DNA and get your genome sequenced. Uh, and we figured out the two biggest concerns that people have are privacy, so they don't know what's going to happen with their genomic data, and also cost. They don't want to pay $1,000 to do it. That might change in the future if insurance companies start subsidizing it, but the, the utility hasn't really been there yet. Um, and part of that comes from the fact that there isn't a lot of data to do useful things with. So the, the current business model looks a little something like the cartoon here. Um, if you want to go get your genome sequenced, you'll typically go to a personal genome sequencing company or a genotyping company. You'll pay them at cost for the service. So let's say it costs you know, $1,000, no profit on top of that to do your whole genome sequence. You'll pay that cost up front. They'll give you back some analytics. After that, these personal genome companies will typically take the data, and then the way they actually make money is by reselling it to uh, data buyers, which can be pharma companies, general medical researchers. Uh, the system's inefficient for various reasons. One, you have researchers paying a premium for health data. 
Second, you have a bunch of different data silos and fragmentation occurring again because you have these different genome sequencing companies with their own data sets that aren't incentivized to make them interoperable. Um, and then, you know, it, it just generally leads to pharma companies like Pfizer and Roche not really using that much genomic data today in a lot of their drug discovery efforts. Um, and it, it's changing a little bit with you know, projects like the UK Biobank where they're spending a ton of money to sequence a bunch of people. Um, there's still a lot of problems that this model uh, leads to. So at Nebula Genomics, we're doing something different. We're allowing individuals and uh, institutional data owners, biobanks, hospitals, to interface directly with data buyers. Uh, you can sell your genomic data, your health data, your clinical records directly to medical researchers. You retain ownership of it. We use different secure computation techniques um, to make sure that your identity is never actually compromised. Um, and this is really valuable to researchers because now you have, you know, you have a decentralized approach. So everyone's storing their data on their own servers. They don't need to give it up to anybody. The access control layer is being built in the blockchain. You get to approve anyone who wants to use your data. You get to approve what they want to use it for. And also pharma companies and researchers get the opportunity to, for recontact. That's something that's really useful and difficult today is to ask follow-up questions and get follow-up data. Um, a lot of the data sets being purchased right now are pretty sparse and don't have everything that can make them as useful as possible. So one, one thing we're doing is, uh, I touched upon this a little bit, is that you know, there are not widespread adopted standards for encoding genomic data. Um, a lot of it exists in these huge files, and it's hard to just transfer it. Um, it's hard to do computation on it. Uh, we're working with Veritas and an open source platform they've developed, Arbados, to encode G DNA in, in uh, much more compact sizes that allows us to build machine learning algorithms and make it easier to actually transfer from one party to another and share, um, and keeps the data a little more uh, secure as well. So our, our we, we sort of have two parts to the business right now. One is going directly to uh, institutions, so people who have large data sets and helping them monetize it without having them give up ownership of it. Um, the second part of our business is direct to consumers. So something we identified pretty early on is to make genomic data very useful, you need to have it complemented with a, a huge array, or array of different types of data sets, including clinical records, electronic health records. Um, and the only one who really has the link to all these data sets is the individual themselves. So we're trying to provide incentives for individuals to upload their own data, um, monetize it, share it with different apps and services, and complement that with genomic data. So we're also providing free sequencing and services like that. And we're partnering with Long Genesis to actually do this part of the platform. Um, I think Alex, wherever Alex is, there he is, we'll do a demo. Great pleasure, and uh, thank you very much, Kamal. Uh, it's a really amazing team. Uh, we are very excited to be partnering with uh, uh, Nebula on this project and uh, right now I'll try to show a demo of what we do. So uh, uh, many of you uh, know me as um, a longevity uh, um, uh, scientist. So everything we do is uh, focused on um, somehow related to aging research. And uh, um, I run a company called In Silico Medicine uh, this company is focused primarily on uh, uh, drug discovery for uh, uh, aging and age-related diseases, and we realized that we need to have a lot of data. So uh, we started partnering with a company called uh, Bitfury about a year ago. They are one of the largest uh, blockchain companies in the world. Uh, I think a multi-billion dollar uh, company right now. And, uh, oh, that's what you see. That's interesting. Can we mirror displays again? Sorry. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the system I'm, uh, I'm going to show. And with Bitfury, we developed uh, a system called uh, Longenesis uh, together. And uh, now uh, this system is going to be managed by uh, Nebula. So right now I'm going to show you uh, a little bit of a um, uh, small preview, an online preview of what we have. So what do you think? Uh, what is more important, a picture or a genome? Can you raise your hand if you think that the genome is more valuable? All right, how many of you think that the picture is more valuable? Not that many. So uh, the genome uh, is extremely valuable and it has a lot of perceived value because it takes a lot of money to, uh, uh, to generate, or at, at least it used to take a lot of money to generate, and you also don't understand how it works very well. But from the genome, you cannot derive a lot of features that you can derive from a picture. From a picture, I can get your age, race, 
Um, sex, uh, we call it sex, we not, don't call it gender, um, unless you're a mouse. Uh, and um, uh, you can derive uh, social status, you can derive a lot of information. Height, weight, uh, body composition. From the genome, you can derive some glimpse of it. So a picture sometimes is very valuable for multiple applications. Also, you can get a lot of insights into the skin. Um, can you see me? So this system takes in multiple data types. It takes in uh, uh, pictures, blood tests, uh, um, transcriptomes, epigenomes, uh, multi-omic data. And you can see currently it's being encrypted and uh, this process is, take, uh, is taking some time right now because it's running off uh, uh, our uh, distributed service system. Uh, and uh, let it run, so it's gonna get encrypted, it's gonna get verified, it's gonna get validated. We're gonna ensure that uh, with a certain probability you are you and not somebody else. We, we, uh, and you, we are still maintaining you as an anonymous person. I'm gonna show you a preview of a system which doesn't use blockchain at this point of time. It's called Young AI. It's currently being piloted, anybody can use it. You earn longevity points instead of uh, uh, a cryptocurrency. And you can also do a photo. Uh, I just tested it today. And uh, upload it. Uh, it will uh, predict my age. That's the only thing it's doing, but actually it will uh, um, so yeah, lighting conditions mean a lot. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, but the thing is, uh, I'm pretty sure nobody here has a pretty good collection of their selfies over time. Uh, and it's definitely not linked to blood tests. Uh, and definitely not linked to transcriptomes. And you can uh, uh, have many, many other data types uh, linked together. So here I basically I track my predicted age over time. And I see what makes me uh, younger or older, what kind of uh, nutraceuticals. So I can see it over a month and I can see uh, how I progress. So uh, this is gonna be one of the applications of the Nebula ecosystem. So you can see that uh, uh, this is, uh, the image is currently being validated. It's being validated by a third party. Uh, and uh, uh, this one I uploaded earlier, I earned uh, uh, three tokens. So we would be earning Nebula tokens uh, and you would be able, as a data buyer, if you want to buy uh, a very large number of pictures with a, say, with a certain quality, with a certain verification and validation, you would be able to do that from, uh, from the system and then train your algorithms on uh, a specific subtype of pictures with, that are very, very well annotated. You can also do blood tests. You can do many, many other um, data types. Currently, we're sandboxing just uh, those uh, uh, data types that you can, uh, uh, that you would put for on Facebook anyway. And uh, uh, we don't require you to, uh, um, uh, to register with your own name. So I'm actually registered as John Doe. Uh, but uh, AI, modern AI allows you to assess a certain probability that you are you uh, by looking at multiple features that we can extract from pictures, blood tests, et cetera, and compare them to what you've claimed on your profile. And then the next following data set that you're uploading, uh, we would be able to compare uh, to the feature set that we already have about you. The data is stored uh, in a distributed fashion, but the references to the data are stored on blockchain. And uh, uh, we know that you, give, that you have given explicit consent uh, to use this data in a specific way. And again, I think that uh, nowadays there are many, many projects like that that are gonna be emerging. We have been de developing the system for over a year with an expert team of blockchain developers. Uh, Bitfury has more than 300 blockchain programmers and we do it on the Exonum platform. And we published a few peer reviewed journals, uh, peer, peer reviewed papers on this uh, over time. Uh, a few more are coming up with, um, uh, with uh, um, Nebula. And I think that uh, in this industry, it's important to establish trust a lot of people rush to ICOs or TGEs or whatever you call them very quickly without doing the work. Uh, but I think that uh, you really need to look at uh, the big picture and play this game in the long term. So it's important to develop the system first and then uh, look at how to compensate people. And that's why we pretty much passed uh, this platform to Nebula because they have great management team. So George Church out of Harvard, he, um, 
launched many multi-billion dollar companies already and also uh, in, in the aging space. And I think that uh, the team they brought together is just spectacular and I applaud Kamal for his efforts on bringing this together. If they do it, TGE, I highly recommend looking into that very, very closely. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, let's open the panel for questions. Thanks, Steph. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Kamal. Very interesting. I have oh, lots yes, of questions, oh, Sorry. which I'll hold, because now we introduce the other guys first. Take a seat. Let me check my timer and see how we're doing. Yeah, you do. Right I, I, I can probably go on the <laughs> side, yeah. OK, so I'll let you guys introduce yourself. And we ha I'll just very quick, Kamal from Nebula is going to say a few. Then we have Nancy. She's doing a, a, a project to democratize venture capital. It sounds quite interesting, but it's not blockchain. But she's working on a blockchain, blockchain project. It is blockchain? <laughs> OK, sorry, I didn't get it. So we're, we're talking about health today. So she's also working for a health company doing a, a, a blockchain project. We have Stefan, who are you the CEO, founder, owner? of Icon, all of them, all, all of the above, yep. All of the above, great. <laughs> Icon, and then we have Alex Green Silva. So quick intro by you. How, how did you end up here as opposed to, you were at Google, so why, yeah. why are you doing what you're doing now? Uh, so I, I went to university at Harvard and was familiar with George Church's work. Um, I then joined Google, worked there for a little bit, and while I was there, towards the tail end of my career there, we worked on blockchain projects. Uh, something that was particularly interesting to us was data sharing and how you can use blockchain to enable different data sharing applications. Um, the, the use case that was compelling to me was specifically health data. Yeah. Uh, in the US particularly, there's a lot of interoperability issues between different electronic health record providers. Uh, it's very hard for doctors to make data-driven decisions. And a lot of this stems from fragmentation, and the data silos that exist in the space. Uh, so I approached George, who runs the Personal Genome Project, which the entire concept was you know, let's create this nonprofit project which gets people to open source their health data uh, and make that available to researchers. So the idea of Nebula Genomics, it's let's do the personal genome project, but let's do that scale. Provide more incentives for people to upload data, actually benefit from the analytics they can get, um, and share it with researchers as well. Super. Yeah. Fantastic. Nancy. Uh, hi, Nancy Fecknay. I am working on a uh, project building it with the blockchain, parts of it, um, uh, to democratize venture capital. And I'm also working with a healthcare company in the UK on looking forward towards what will the blockchain community do to the healthcare, how can they prepare for that, and um, how can they start moving towards a, a blockchain solution for what they've already built. Super. Stephen. Oh, and I guess before, or you yeah. wanted to ask the cover before? Before I was in... So why'd you get here? Yeah, why'd uh, you end up doing this? Sorry. Um, before this, I was in venture capital for about seven years. I started two companies, um, one success, one failure, and a nonprofit, which, by the way, my nonprofit somehow ended up on the agenda, so sorry for the confusion there. Um, that is a mental health um, nonprofit focused on entrepreneurs. And the way I ended up doing the project that I'm working on now is that... Um, I'm an assistant engineer by training, and for me, inefficiency um, is really a frustration. Um, and I've seen a lot of inefficiencies over seven years in, um, of, of investing. And now with blockchain technology, we have an opportunity to fix those inefficiencies and also create a system that's much more transparent. So doing that now with my team. Excellent. Great. Stefan. Hi, I'm uh, Stefan Rover. Um, I got into this uh, space from sort of several different Angles. I'm a serial tech entrepreneur. Um, I started a company in the uh, mid-90s that did encryption uh, technology for online banking. Um, took that public in Germany and then later in the US uh, when I moved out there to California. Um, uh, after that, I got into um, uh, DNA sequencing. I uh, started a company um, actually on uh, which uh, uh, George Church was one of the uh, key advisors. Uh, so we. Uh, created a um, nanopore-based um, uh, uh, low-cost sequencing technology that was acquired by uh, Roche um, a couple of years ago. Um, uh, from then on, I continued to do uh, several companies in the life sciences space, uh, including a, um, 
a company that does uh, antibiotics for multidrug resistant bacteria, and a sort of AI driven um, uh, personalized oncology uh, uh, a company. Uh, recently, um, I started a, a company in the blockchain space together with my co-founder, Mark, who's going to give a talk on Icon uh, here soon, uh, which uh, basically helps software building block providers, API providers, uh, to monetize those uh, and make them available using blockchain technology. So an example of that could be if you're a um, model provider. Let's say you have a heart model, heart simulation model, um, that you want to make available. Um, somebody else provides models that feed into that, for example, a tissue model. Uh, the tissue model uh, calls another uh, model, say a cell model. The cell model needs to call a protein or an enzyme model. All of these are software building blocks, and there's really no good way for these to interoperate uh, today, uh, both technically uh, uh, as well as sort of access control. And even at the commercial level, rights management, uh, the use case would be, let's say somebody wants to spin up a heart model, plug a patient's DNA in, and say, how would this uh, drug actually uh, work on this patient with this particular DNA? But in order to answer that question, all of these components sort of needs to be instantiated. Uh, that type of interoperability is what we're trying to address with, with ICON for software building blocks in the broadest sense. But health is sort of a particularly good application of that. Thank you. Well, Alex Javankov, um, my uh, background is in GPU computing. So my first two bachelor degrees were in computer science and management of information systems. Then I worked for um, a number of semiconductor companies, uh, later ATI Technologies, a company which pretty much pioneered the uh, GPGPU. Uh, so if you are in blockchain, you will know NVIDIA. So at that time, we were actually, I think, bigger than NVIDIA. Uh, and um, uh, I made, I was a director of the company, so made uh, some money, and then uh, realized that uh, what's important in life, you know, if life is uh, so short and you reach uh, a peak at some point of time and then you continuously decline and uh, die, <laughs> not a, uh, it's not a really interesting perspective, and uh, whatever disease you're looking at is pre pretty much always age-related, so we need to look at the core. So I uh, quit my job and went and did my uh, graduate work at Johns Hopkins. I uh, then did my PhD in MSU at, at MSU and, uh, in physics and mathematics. I uh, ran a couple labs uh, and uh, I started in silico. So I looked at uh, many, many projects uh, in the aging space, uh, volunteered here and there, um, uh, started a couple companies, uh, and then uh, realized that uh, AI is probably the most uh, potent and most efficacious way to go after aging, because you can encompass a lot of features and uh, integrate a lot of data with just one feature, age. So that pretty much unites everything. So I can compare myself to this laptop uh, because it has age. On a molecular level, there are some similarities we can capture. I can do cross-species comparison. I can uh, uh, look at many, many objects uh, through the prism of aging and understand those minute changes that transpire during uh, aging and time, and how do they become diseases. So uh, we started in Silico initially as a transcriptomics analysis uh, uh, company, gene expression analysis company, and then uh, uh, when deep learning came to be, we switched to, uh, to deep learning and multimodal data, started identifying uh, biologically, uh, uh, biological targets with multiple diseases that are age-related, and linking multiple data types together. Uh, and then went into chemistry quite heavily. So past three years, uh, we've been very, very heavily involved in uh, uh, AI for chemistry. So using generative adversarial networks and reinforcement learning to generate novel molecular structures with a desired set of characteristics. We also generate synthetic patient data using uh, guns. Uh, so now you don't have any more privacy concerns. You train on a lot of data sets and then you create patients you want. Uh, and uh, got into blockchain about a year ago with Bitfury, and now we are passing this pl platform to Nebula, thank you very much, and uh, uh, I think that's gonna be a very successful business and open up um, uh, a path to studying aging in a completely new way, because right now we are living in an age of data economics. That's the only way to study it. Well, good luck with the partnership, I'll ask you a couple of questions about that. I have my first question, so thanks for the, you are obviously very qualified, a lot more than I am. So I have a question, I'll pick randomly who I would like to answer this, otherwise we're gonna stay here forever if everybody answers it. So I'd like to ask Stefan a question first. 
a lot of new technologies um, suffer from a problem. You know, I've done 25 years of digital, and very often you see that a new shiny technology comes about, and then people start thinking how to retrofit it into a problem. And so there is a classic issue of, is the technology looking for the problem, or you look at the problem and you try to solve with the technology? So Stefan, do you think that blockchain is being applied to healthcare just because it's sexy and it's everybody's talking about it and it raises money easily? Or is there really a need for blockchain and healthcare? Yeah, that's a good, good question. Um, fundamentally, blockchain technology in many applications is actually more expensive, more cumbersome than traditional technology. Think about it, in order to sort of maintain uh, this consensus net that reaches agreement on what the operations on the blockchain should be. You know, all these uh, um, computers need to store the same data, uh, perform the same operations, so it's inherently more expensive than a centralized system. So why would you use it? Uh, there's a couple applications where it makes sense. One is if you don't want central control of the data. Um, so let's say you have a community of participants that don't want one particular company Microsoft or Illumina or Google sitting in the middle and owning everything. Now you can sort of outsource it to this uh, a community um, and you can uh, build it in a way that, that the, those um, uh, operators um, aren't um, sort of a rent extracting entity that's trying to squeeze as much profit out of it as possible. You can sort of hard code the rules into the system that you really only pay what it costs to, to operate it, but you don't have to sort of uh, uh, pay the, uh, the, the profit, uh, for, in many cases, monopoly level profits, like you would do, for, for example, to Illumina and sequencing. Um, but a third um, advantage of the blockchain, and, and that's kind of how the technology originally evolved, is that it's censorship proof, right? So if you look at Bitcoin, for example, that's a private label currency um, that can be used to transfer money anonymously and operate outside of sort of the government regulated um, uh, systems, right? Um, and Many, many applications built on the blockchain take advantage of the, that they're censorship proof. With censorship proof, what's really meant is that they don't have to conform to government regulations. So if Russia says, you can't store uh, Russian uh, citizens' DNA data outside of the country, well, put it on the blockchain. There's nothing they can do about it, right? Or if the US government uh, says to 23andMe, uh, who was uh, collecting patient data and for a long time uh, doing medical analysis on that, it'll tell you, are you susceptible to Parkinson's disease or do you have Alzheimer risk? So it was a very useful service. Uh, the FDA sent uh, 23 me a letter and said, demonstrate to us that you're entitled to do what you're doing, right? Um, and it, the uh, 23 and me th uh, threw in the towel and removed the uh, medical data. Well, with the blockchain technology, you could have sort of a neutral storage platform in the middle operated by the community Anybody in the world can provide sequencing and upload that data onto the blockchain, and then any other company in the world can do medical analysis on that. And between those three parties involved, there's nobody to go after, right? And if somebody wants to start doing um, analysis and telling you what your medical risk is, you as a patient can start using that service. And the FDA doesn't have any entity that it can go and shut down because they don't know who's operating it, they don't know who owns it. And even if they did, the entity doesn't do all of the pieces required to qualify it as a medical uh, service or device. So those are the types of applications uh, that I think will really benefit from, from using blockchain. That's a good answer. So I have a question for Kamal. It, the, the blockchain is distributed, but if I am sequencing my DNA with you guys in Nebula, I'm going through you. Yeah. And, and in my mind, uh, you will be the one, essentially the gatekeeper, and, and the man in the street, you know, even myself, you know, which have a pretty high level of education, I'm not really sure what data you do have or you don't have, if you retain anything, because the data is coming through you, and it's living in my bitcoins, I bought them with Coinbase, so I need to go back to Coinbase to get my bitcoins because I don't know where to put them. You know, I haven't thought about putting them on a USB stick in my safe at home, which I don't think many people do. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? Because this is all very good in theory, this decentralization, but from a public perspective and user perspective, you're still gonna go through, I'm gonna have to go back to you to get my data back and monetize it. Yeah, so that's a good point. There's an element of trust with who's actually performing the sequencing that exists today. 
uh, we're, we're sequencing provider agnostic. As long as it's a verified sequencer and they you know, have done the proper certification and they do high quality sequencing, we'll let them use our platform. Um, we're working with a few right now, so you don't have to go through us necessarily. You can choose which one you go through. Okay. Still though, you're trusting that third party to not retain your data, not retain your bio sample. Um, it's a limitation of the system today that's likely to change in the future. People are already working on home sequencers when you can do some sequencing at home. Um, so yeah, it, it's just the current state of things is you do need to go through a third party to do sequencing. The Illumina machines are, you know, it's a million dollars each or more. Um, right. You won't have one on your, uh, on your bench or anything. Yeah. And Nancy, what do you think of this? Because obviously, if you're trying to go mass market with, with, uh, with this type of technologies, you know, it's gonna be, the bio to entry has to be really, really low. There must be trust element, which is in a way is the advantage of people like the NHS, even if they don't have very good high tech, but you kind of somehow maybe I trust them more to have my DNA data than some American startup, with respect. <laughs> so as you're working on this project, what, what kind of, uh, what's your view on this and what are the challenges? Um, I'll say a few things about that. I think one, I've actually been surprised that people are so trusting there's a lot uh, along the way as the more I learn about the UK healthcare system and how much of our data they're storing. Um, there's a lack of education, I think, from the consumer's perspective of, of how much control they really have um, and how they're storing that data and its level of security. Um, I think from, a turn, from your question around like what, what are the barriers to this, I actually think first we need to educate individuals around the blockchain because the mass public, I mean, probably not everybody in this room, I would imagine, but a, a lot of the average person it still sees you know, the headlines about different cryptos being hacked or smart contracts being hacked and then thinks that everything within the blockchain space is insecure. And so I would actually, I would say that it's a challenge on an educational front first, and then once we have that, people become more aware of A, how secure it can be, and, and B, how it can be utilized to actually create a better world for them. So my viewpoint on it is in maybe, I, I hate putting a timeline on this because I could very well be wrong, but let's say five years, maybe seven years, we'll be able to have um, walk into the doctor's office or walk into a, a secondary care physician and provide a key which allows them to access the per certain parts of data pertinent to what we're doing there today that will help with that visit, which will be um, relevant to exactly what we're in there for the treatment for. And everything will be stored on the blockchain. We'll be able to access just the pieces that we need and it will be secure and safe so that I can go from the UK treatment center back to the US and have treatment done there so that they can see all my longitudinal data along the series of my life and be able to say, hey, you look like you've been experiencing these symptoms since you were seven, you have celiac disease, which you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people get misdiagnosed and all this stuff. So I think that's the way I see it happening, but we're still a ways from it actually getting there in terms of education and the technology itself. Yeah, I want, I want to add one thing to that. Um, I think the education part is key. I, I showed the survey up there we did where 30% of people had privacy concerns about how their DNA would actually be used. But when you go to 23andMe, I think they have around 95% of people click the terms and conditions, which essentially signs away their data to, to resell to whoever. Um, so most people don't really understand what's being done with their data. Even in the US, your electronic health record uh, is just being, your name's being stripped off, your address is being stripped off, and it's being resold to data brokers and on secondary markets. Uh, it's still not that difficult to link that back to the individual, but most people aren't aware of this and aren't educated about how their data is actually being used and the risks they're being presented to. I think if they were, you'd see a lot more concern about um, you know, the potential for data breaches and the potential for your data to be abused. It's like with Facebook, all of a sudden yeah. people are really scared because there's been a breach and now they're paying attention to it, but before we were all blindly just allowing it. I think they still do, most of them. <laughs> so let's do a quick survey here. I'll do, I have a couple of relevant questions. One is, we'll talk about terms and conditions, which obviously with GDPR, I'm sure you all received a million emails in the last few weeks which was a great opportunity, by the way, to automatically unsubscribe to things you didn't care about because you just didn't respond and <laughs> emails disappeared. So how many of you regularly read terms and conditions before accepting them? Raise your hand if you do. Sometimes. One, two, <laughs> Sometimes. three. We're hiring a lawyer, so if you want to come and work with us to review all our <laughs> documentation. <laughs> That's only three people read terms and conditions. It's a massive problem. GDPR is not going to solve that. And this is gonna be one of the thing, the big challenges 
for this type of technology because the moment you are requesting people to trust, it's going to be my next question to Alex, you trust who you're going to trust. You know, if people don't even read terms and condition, that's a long way to go. The second question about education is how many of you here have bought cryptocurrencies? I would say that's what, 20%? So again, you know, cryptocurrencies are pretty popular and only 20% bought them because you can buy $10. You don't have to invest a million dollars. So the educational thing is gonna take a long time, I think. So question for Alex. So trust, you know, who do I, why, you know, the DNA is my most precious thing in theory, once I'm educated and understand that. So how do I decide who I want to give it to, can I, does, does it have to be just one master copy that I, that I own that I can share with others or would I entrust, you know, who should I entrust? Should it be Apple because I like their phones or should it be the NHS? Should it be my health insurance? What is your view on this? So I think the issue of trust is uh, currently the predominant uh, issue in uh, healthcare in general and in data sharing in general. So do you trust Facebook? Do I trust Facebook? I do trust Facebook. I do trust Apple. I do trust Samsung and I do trust uh, Google because uh, if they misuse my data in a very severe way, most likely uh, they will lose their business. They don't want to jeopardize a billion dollar business uh, uh, for uh, something that uh, might not generate a lot of opportunity. So they don't have that behavior for uh, going out and breaking things and just having do, do, making things done uh, with your data uh, just to make a quick buck. So they are very, very good at uh, data security. So you haven't heard about a case where somebody from Google went into your email and uh, uh, stole something from there. So. I think there is a lot of trust with those large organizations. The bigger question is that who do I trust in blockchain or in uh, smaller companies who uh, now start getting into the data trade uh, and trying to profit from, uh, well, the hype in blockchain, hype in AI, uh, and generally the demand for data is increasing. So right now uh, I am a data buyer, a lot of other people are data buyers. We try to buy anonymized data and try to buy something that can be sandboxed without hurting anybody. So blood tests, I cannot uniquely identify anybody by the blood test. But there are many, many people going out and saying that you know what, I'm gonna be doing blockchain trading on, block, on, on blockchain, uh, uh, gen, uh, on genomic data. And uh, for that, you really need to have experts and you need to have uh, uh, teams who are there for a long term, who are very well funded and uh, who are not going to give your data uh, into the wrong hands. Uh, right now, we don't understand the value of data as much as we should. We are, we are experts, we are uneducated about the value of data. If you were to ask me how much is my genome worth plus my picture plus my uh, transcriptome, uh, plus maybe videos of myself, uh, and plus uh, uh, some healthcare information and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, let's say urine, microbiome, etc. I wouldn't be able to tell you how much this data is, that is worth. Maybe if I have some uh, rare cancer down the road, I become a millionaire just having this data. Uh, maybe if this data ha lands in the wrong hands, somebody can replicate uh, a lot of my biometrics or somebody can uh, um, use that for uh, insurance purposes or malicious purposes. So we don't know how damaging this data is. We don't know how valuable this data is. We need to be very careful with this data because when you apply AI to those data sets uh, and you uh, process, you, you let it ingest a lot of it, uh, a lot of the data, uh, you might see some uh, really uh, really surprising results. A good clinical geneticist can diagnose about a thousand diseases just by looking at your picture. AI can see uh, millions more pictures than uh, a clinical geneticist. So you can actually do GWAS uh, studies on pictures. So those are valuable, uh, valuable tools. When it's combined with other data types, it could be very damaging. So I think you need to trust people who are piloting, who are uh, really taking it serious, and actually who have a lot to lose. So I think that uh, right now in blockchain uh, 
uh, in uh, healthcare data on blockchain, there are maybe like five blue chip companies out there in terms of startups. Uh, you have to look at the credibility of the team, you look at the uh, sustainability of the business model, uh, you look at who the investors are and how quickly they are rolling it out. If they are just out there and fundraise, fundraising and after that becoming a traveling uh, conference circus, showing that uh, they have something and they're learning, forming consortium, I think that's, uh, uh, that's a bad sign. Good sign is when you, are, uh, when you have a team of uh, really, really credible uh, uh, people like George Church, for example, who went out and broke things before, uh, but uh, he always did it in a very credible manner uh, and um, always did it in a very academic sense with informed consent and uh, these guys are proceeding with caution. So that's why I would trust my genome to Nebula, for example. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Stefan, do you think that blockchain being very complicated, needs little education, the trust issues, might end up just being a B2B business. You know, essentially something under the bonnet. I used to say, you know, you have your fridge, you have no idea how it works, but the beer or champagne, whatever you taste is, is cold and you're happy. Uh, so my sense is that probably B2B will be a bigger opportunity, especially in the short term, because if we have to wait for everybody to be educated, we can spend a lot of VC money before that day comes. <laughs> I certainly think that only businesses are going to need to learn the details of blockchain and consumers are going to be shielded from the crypto complexity. Um, the same way, you know, consumers didn't have to learn TCP IP and HTTP and SSL and all these and HTML, you know, basically you open your browser and there it is, there's the internet, right? Um, so a lot of the blockchain uh, capabilities are gonna make it into uh, browsers and applications and essentially be invisible to the consumer. Um, but what the consumer is gonna see is a whole new range um, of applications. Um, for example, there will be some emerging standard for a permanent distributed file system, um, and that's already out there with IPFS, and that's sort of an immutable file system that you just write uh, something to. And once it's there, it's there forever, and you, there's no way to get it removed. Um, even if there's a copyright infringement or something, it's just on there, right? Um, some of those are general purpose systems, under, others are um, Systems like Steam and Steamit, which is a sort of view on Steam. Steam is just a, a blogging um, a platform, um, sort of a Twitter, Facebook, social network replacement. Somebody posts something on there, it's on there forever, right? Uh, and access to that. Oh, that's scary. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then access to those resources is going to be built into tools like the browser, and, and people are just going to be able to, to get to it, right? Um, so someone's going to create the standard. Uh, for, and maybe it's Nebula, or hopefully it is, is going to create the standard for storing medical records and genomic information in this, uh, in, in this type of world where it's distributed and immutable um, and hopefully um, privacy protected, right? Because what you can do, one final thought on that, is you can store that data, you can choose to store it open, but you can also choose to store it encrypted. Um, uh, and in the blockchain world, at least, because the code is sort of distributed and open, you know whether or not it's really encrypted and you know if there's a flaw. And obviously the consumer isn't gonna uh, inspect that code. But I have no idea what WhatsApp is really doing. They say, um, yeah, they're encrypting my messages, right? And I have to trust them, right, that uh, they're encrypting it. But the blockchain version of that, that, um, that Telegram is uh, rolling out now, um, everybody will uh, see that code and know exactly is it encrypted or not. And that will be true for this genomic data where anybody can find a flaw in it and, and by looking at the code. And so there's a much better way to trust what's in the open than to trust somebody just making that promise. Of course, yeah. of course. Okay, so we've got some uh, time for questions from you guys. If you have any questions, raise your hand and somebody's gonna bring you a mic. Thanks guys. Uh, two questions, one very quick specific one for Alex. Uh, what are your thoughts on Sirolimus? compound uh, and then a more generic question uh, to you guys so how do you think about so for patient records for instance like how do you think about creating um, a standard that is commoditized enough so that effectively can truly integrate across the board right 
uh, and create scale effects in integrated data sets. Thank you. So zero limits, right? So zero limits, uh, I mean, it's probably for a different discussion, but uh, it's, a, um, it's a drug called drapamycin uh, by uh, Sinovartis drug. Uh, right now it's a generic. They actually have a better version called Everolimus. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, studies implicated that particular drug in uh, aging and longevity, just like metformin. So it hits a very specific pathway, you know, biological pathway, which results in life extension. It has, uh, it's not a very clean drug. It's not a single targeting drug. So it uh, targets multiple biological targets. And uh, I think at this point of time, uh, the jury is still out about whether you should uh, look at that for uh, pro prophylactic use at this point of time. Uh, there are many, many companies working on repologs, uh, analogs of that drug. Uh, and I think that a lot of them are very promising and th they are gonna be extending life. Uh, Novartis published a really cool study in 2014, uh, December, Science Translation Medicine, showing that uh, a six weeks course of uh, Everolimus, it's an analog of Serolimus, um, uh, in healthy elderly patients improved uh, uh, their response to vaccines. So it boosted their immune system. And that gives me a lot of confidence that it's, it has a lot of good anti-aging properties. So I think that drug has to be explored, of course. And the next question was, to whom? Integration of patient records. Is integration on a national level or international level? International. Across, so across companies, okay. Uh, sorry, thank you. Because there's obviously a lot of health records companies out there already, yes. right? Yeah, so, so I, I think we, we've thought about this a lot, about how can you make uh, electronic health records more interoperable, and I, I can speak specifically to the US. Um, our, we're, we're not trying to replace health records, we're just gonna make tools for patients to pull their health record from whatever service provider they're using, uh, be that Epic or whatever else is, is popular. Uh, there, there's, there's standards being put in place right now that, you know, standard APIs that these service providers are supposed to implement and allow interoperability between different health record providers. Uh, right now, in most areas, they don't have a real incentive to do this. A lot of their competitive advantage is that they're not interoperable. Uh, a good example is we talked to some hospitals in Boston, and they, they spent $2 billion over two years implementing Epic. Uh, and all the doctors hate it, right? They don't enjoy using it. Um, but they're not going to switch anytime soon. So we're not going to come to them with a new health record and say you should use this. Uh, there is some regulatory, uh, some regulatory overhead that's coming in, specifically in the U.S., and I think that's going to be needed to actually make sure these EHRs start behaving a little more responsibility, uh, more responsibly, and making it easier to actually share data between each other. I think it's a difficult one because on your MD, obviously, we, we we're dealing with primary care information, and it's very fragmented. It's, you know, and if I get a blood test from my GP, I can't even get the results myself. So I mean, I've still tried to access my records from my GP practice, still haven't worked out how to do it. So it's, again, long way, and there's going to be, it's very different standards. But the UK, I think, is pushing quite hard on this. And, you know, I would expect in the next three years, everybody in the UK should be able to access and download their, their health records somehow. The public um, ones, the NHS ones. Yeah, yeah the NHS ones, yeah, the NHS ones. But the private healthcare system. No, private, no. Completely off that, yeah. Yeah, yeah because I actually, am, I'm not so, so, I guess one of the challenges I see is that in a way we're swimming against the tide because um, the incumbents, the last thing they want to do is let data fly, let people actually control their own data. You know, they'd much rather do data blocking in the US than allow people to actually get control of their data. I'm not even convinced that it's the standards or formats because in healthcare we've got just a bucket load of, you know, standards around how we exchange information between, you know, from HR7 to you know, a whole set of standards. Um, what sort of... Um, pushback are you guys finding um, as you try to um, socialize this idea with, because I guess pushback both in terms of these, these incumbent data aggregators um, or data you know, systems managers and also kind of the providers and then also the payers. What sort of pushback are you getting for this approach to, to releasing the data, so to speak, and giving it back to the control of the data subjects? So uh, the healthcare providers like it. And, and there's specifically, they're very interested in 
giving patients control of their health and giving them better tools to actually manage their health care and their health data. Um, so we've had a lot of buy-in from them, which has been nice. The, the electronic health record providers, uh, luckily we don't, we don't need their buy-in because in the U.S. you have to provide access to an online patient portal. You have to allow patients to download their electronic health records. So we're not relying on their buy-in. Um, and then for the, the when, when you say payers, you're talking about in, in insurance? Yeah. Um, so insurance companies have been very interested in this. Uh, specifically, not, not the, the use case that's scary is, you know, an insurance company will look at your genome and identify that you're at risk for something and then charge you more. Uh, technically, it's illegal, but it's still something that people are afraid of. We, we've seen interest in the idea, and we're talking to some right now, the idea of can we use this data to better plan, you know, different payment plans for different individuals, understand which treatments will be more successful. Because this is, again, specific to the U.S., is insurance companies are spending a lot more on healthcare for worse outcomes than other countries are doing. And a lot of that comes from the fact that there isn't aggregate data that's easy to share. It's not easy to stratify patients into different bins and identify which treatments will actually lead to the best outcomes. Uh, so there's been a lot of buy-in and interest from them to enable tools like this. More questions? More there. there. Sorry, I have the mic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, first thank you, you for asking the really sharp questions. I actually have two quick comments and one question for Kamala. The first thing is, in terms of storing large amounts of data on the blockchain, I don't think the blockchain is meant to do this. Unless you're talking about private blockchain, which basically you don't need a blockchain, you just need a central database. The second thing is IPFS, when you talk about IPFS technology, that's distributed file storage system, is totally encrypted. You can only be decrypted by an individual private key. So um, as long as there's no private keys available, it's burned. The data may be there forever, but no one can actually access it. So um, that's second. And third is that um, it's actually illegal to store all your um, health data, et cetera, on the blockchain that's against GDPR and HIPAA as well. So the question to you, Kamala, is that you mentioned oh. that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, because I'm in this Stand space up. and I can't really your knees there. About <laughs> Go there, on your knees. <laughs> Those are also UK specific. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, so my question for Kamala is that you mentioned that for Nebula um, Genomics, um, the data sits with the data owners. Yeah. And as you know, in certain jurisdictions around the world, that's where the data actually sits with the hospitals. You and I, our data actually sits in the hospital and actually belongs to them and not to us, which I find ridiculous. Yeah. So how are you actually getting past that, um, given that you also said that um, individuals have already signed away their consent without reading without reading the terms and conditions, right? So the data is being resold and resold and resold. Um, so when you actually get that data from the data owners and who, are, who may not be the individuals, how are you actually gonna get that consent enabled again by the individual? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so for GDPR and HIPAA, we're working with experts there to make sure we are compliant. None of the data is actually being stored on the blockchain. Uh, we're, we're, Effectively, what we're saying is we're storage agnostic. So we have a data management tool. You can store it in your own, an encrypted format. You can store it in your Google Drive, your Dropbox. Uh, you can store it in your own machine. So we're letting individuals store, in their, own, store their own data off-chain and effectively providing pointers to their data and the access control layers on the blockchain. So that's why we have a public blockchain, completely trustless, and they get to see who wants to use the, who, who wants to request access to their data. Um, this is very important specifically, maybe not so much for individuals, but it is important for the institutional data owners that don't want the data to leave their servers or their facilities uh, or their biobanks. Um, I'm trying to remind myself what the rest of the question was. Um, so yeah, and blockchain is necessary for, uh, for this type of applications because you actually, you store the keys and the data pointers on blockchain. You would not store an MRI on blockchain because it's a huge, uh, very uh, spacious data that requires, uh, requires a truck, essentially, if you want to load uh, uh, tens of thousands of people on there. So uh, you would just use pointers, and those pointers can actually be changed later on uh, to comply with GDPR. I think GDPR is actually a beautiful thing, if you read about it. It's very useful. Yeah, and and um, in terms of consent, is is very tricky. It depends a lot on different jurisdictions. Um, UK has pretty different laws than the US does. US is a little more relaxed when it comes to blanket consents. So you'll, sign, you'll, you'll sign your data away, essentially, to be used in different studies. Uh, institutional data owners already have ownership of your data. So they're able, effectively, if they've gotten the rights to monetize it, they already have those rights. When it comes to consumers, we have a different consent process for them. Uh, we're we're fine-tuning that right now, but it's going to be fairly rigorous to make sure individuals actually understand 
how their data is being used. A, a good example is our co-founder started the Personal Genome Project, which I alluded to earlier, which is about open sourcing your health data. Um, they made every person who wanted to join this project take a test that made sure they understood you know, how, what DNA was, uh, how DNA worked, how replication worked. They had to learn, make sure they learned all these different things and understand it well, and a lot of people actually were turned away from participating in the Personal Genome Project. Um, they were, that's a certain extreme for how stringent they were, and we're gonna make sure you know, we have some barriers to make sure you actually understand how your data could be used. Yeah, was can I ask you in from there? Sure. Ewing, sorry, yeah. Um, hey, so you talked about the dream being sort of even through blockchain, you have this distributed um, system which allows patient choice sort of and consent over their data. How is that gonna work moving forward sort of for people where informed consent is more difficult around like learning disabilities, neurodegenerative disorders. Like, where, how do you see that moving? Yeah, that was for me, right? Who wants to take this? People with... Uh, I think that was nebula specific. Um, nebula specific? Yeah, so, so right now... Back on your knees. <laughs> <laughs> right now, yeah, that's, that's another good question. Um, well, yeah, we have pretty strict consent processes in place. Uh, to actually do your whole genome sequencing and share that, you need to go through a doctor. Uh, you need to make sure you're actually counseled on how that works. Um, that's, that's the current process in place, and that's, that's pretty strict, and maybe that won't be necessary in the future, but that's what we're doing today. I just Richard, want to actually... Uh, Richard, are we okay with time? Is, uh, we got a few more. One more, two, one more. <laughs> yeah. One more question. <laughs> the golden question. Who's got the golden question? Time there is flashing. Anybody's got the last? It's gotta be good, huh? Because it's the last one. <laughs> no pressure. I feel the pressure. Um, so this is more directed towards um, Nebula and general, um, everyone can comment on it. As um, based on um, the business models when you're running this kind of um, uh, project or this type of startup, because um, it, it strikes me that in AI generally, the winners are people who can generate proprietary data. Um, and then if you're you facilitated everyone to own their own data, what's your moat? What's, what's going to stop you from um, uh, competitors? Yeah, the, the issue is people haven't really been able to create useful health data sets. It's been very difficult today. So the type, like the holy grail would be you know, genomic data with longitudinal clinical data, electronic health records, lab test results, everything that Alex is trying to collect and things that he use, uses and makes really useful. That's the type of data researchers really want, and that's not really available at scale today. Um, you see a lot of personal genome sequencing companies that their business model revolved around sort of what you're saying, creating those proprietary data sets but they haven't been able to effectively monetize those data sets because you, you get a snapshot of an individual's health at one time. Recontact is difficult. You don't get all the data that researchers actually want eventually. It's hard to deal with all the use cases. So, you know, the, the, our, we're not a data play. We're not trying to create a really valuable proprietary data set that's for ourselves. We're just trying to build a network that's gonna be open sourced uh, and useful for researchers to access. But you're gonna be the one doing the transactions. Yeah, yeah, so the way the business model works right now is a, a small percentage of each transaction effectively that we mediate through the network. I mean, if, if you look forward um, with blockchain technology, traditional copyright is gonna be harder and harder to enforce because basically once information is out there, somebody can put it on a network and there's no way to remove it, whether it's music or a video, et cetera, right? Um, the, um, the information that is best protected doesn't rely on copyright, it's essentially the AI learning, right? Because um, I can now make my service available that's built on AI without exposing the underlying model, right? Um, so that, that is sort of inherent, uh, not uh, legislatively uh, guaranteed copyright, it's effectively a trade secret, right? And whoever has access to the most data as input is gonna have the most intelligent uh, AI to produce this um, uh, more effective output. So there's inherent a tendency towards building monopolies there. Um, uh, and the only way we can sort of um, uh, prevent that is by putting as much of the input data onto the blockchain as possible. If we make the input data um, uh, uh, relatively openly accessible and patients, for example, uh, for health data then can give uh, permissions to companies they want to support or research projects they want to support and say, hey, you can get a re read access to my data, then other people can build the learnings on, t on yeah. top of that, right? So that's really where I see the power that you can easily share that input data so that anybody can start building learnings on top of that. Okay, I think we wrap it up. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.